getting started. I thought, hang on. There we go. So a little bit about the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative. Uh, we're a collaboration of a, mo a bunch of uh, different conservation organizations. Uh, we're working together to try to understand why uh, prairie reconstructions fail or succeed in an effort to make sure that all our future reconstructions work the way we expect them to do, that they're biologically diverse, they're ecologically functional, uh, resist invasion by um, non-natives, and that they're um, probably just as important that they're cost-effective and successful to implement and manage. Uh, we do that by entering site data, planning and management data into a specially designed database. We use standardized monitor monitoring protocols, data analysis, and then we, uh, a big part of it is sharing our information with others so we can all learn collectively. And we deliver that information through a variety of formats. Uh, we expect to have newsletters, webinars, field days, hopefully some scientific articles. Uh, we're still working on our communication plan, so all those details aren't uh, finalized yet, but we are moving in that direction. And we do currently have some information on the web, and that's hosted by the Eastern Tallgrass Prairie and Big Rivers Landscape Conservation Cooperative. And there's the address for you, and um, we'll mention that again later. And just a couple other notes that a couple of the guiding principles um, for the reconstruction initiative is that uh, reconstructions are, are guided by the best available science. It's the whole part of the database. We want to make this a, an analytic process rather than just a bunch of people working together by the seat of the pants. The seat of the pants stuff is good, but I think the science is better. Um, we recognize that a lot of people throughout the conservation community in the Midwest are um, reconstruction par reconstructing prairie is a big part of your conservation goals. Uh, we recognize that uh, diverse reconstructions <coughs> support the bi larger biological and ecological integrity of our sites. And we look, we approach it from an ecosystem perspective rather than just a single species perspective. And that again, that our, our techniques will improve our efficiency and our effectiveness. Uh, and to learn a little bit more about PRI, um, the Tallgrass Prairie LCC will be hosting a webinar on March 8th. And we'll be discussing a little bit more specifically about the database, maybe your monitoring protocol, and how you can get involved. And, and again, there is the address for the website and for the particular, um, for that uh, webinar. So, you should have that. And I'm going to pass the ball over to Mike, and we will get going. And in a second, you lost. There you are. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, thanks to Paul and Amanda for uh, hosting this webinar and inviting us to speak about years of restoration at the yes, Madison Harbor and Curtis Curry. Um, as Paul mentioned, my name is Brad Herrick, I'm the Harbor Ecologist. And uh, I'm with my colleague, Michael Hansen, who's the land care manager, and we're going to kind of attack the webinar this morning. Uh, so it's good from both of us um, throughout the, the uh, talk. Um, and so, it's, you know, putting this uh, together for a webinar was a pretty good time for the past. We're talking about the 80 years of history and, and repair and restoration, um, and trying to summarize it uh, within an hour. And, is challenging. So we're going to be obviously talking kind of in broad about a lot of those issues, but um, hopefully by the end we'll come away with a better understanding of kind of what the prairie is, um, at least, um, the pet communities, and what are some of the challenges in maintaining and, and managing um, the world's oldest uh, prairie restoration. Um, so briefly, this is kind of what we'll talk about this morning. Um, let's do some, some background. Uh, a little bit of historical research that's been done here, um, and then kind of put sort of it into a landscape context for you. Talk about the historical and current use of recorded fire. Um, uh, just a little bit about the vegetation data, especially monitoring data that we have, and then wrap up with uh, some lessons learned from our perspective. So the Arboretum and 
Curtis Curry, are located uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we have about 200 acres of uh, wetlands, woodlands, oak savanna, various prairie types, and uh, manicured gardens, uh, really in the center of, of, of Madison. Um, and we're nestled with a 2,500 uh, acre watershed, um, the Lake Winger watershed. And we'll come back to that uh, later on and why that's significant. Um, and uh, part of that is that we're we're actually located physically at the bottom of that watershed, and so in terms of um, uh, impact from the farming community, uh, those impacts are, are critical in uh, manage in, in, in how we manage this prairie. So I have a couple of slides on, on background. Again, this is going to be very brief. There's a long history. Uh, a lot of people involved in um, developing the arboretum, region, uh, let alone Curtis Prairie. Um, so in 1934, the Arboretum was officially dedicated. Um, and at that dedication, all the vehicles gave the keynote for us and sort of outlined the vision uh, for the Arboretum as a whole. And um, one of the main points is that this idea was was um, expected to include all of the uh, ecological, ecological communities in Wisconsin at the Arboretum. So really creating kind of a um, for lack of a better word, a, a museum of the natural systems of Wisconsin at one place. And as you can imagine, back in the early 30s, it was, it was challenging to, for professors to bring their students and classes to see some of these you know, northern Wisconsin systems. It was just hard to get, uh, to, to get that far north from, from Madison. So that was kind of the emphasis uh, to, to be able to bring students for teaching and for research to one location. Uh, and talk about the importance of those habitats. Um, so this part of Wisconsin, part of Wisconsin, Dane County, where we're located, um, was primarily openings and, and marsh at the time of uh, European settlement. And we know that from the, the land survey records from 1835. Mm -hmm. um, and so primarily those are you know, large furrow uh, and wide oak dominated systems in the uplands with about 15 to 20 trees per acre. And the ground surface covers primarily with prairie grasses, forbs, and scattered shrubs. That kind of, that's kind of the pre-settlement conditions that we are, are uh, working towards in, in many cases at the R region. Uh, the original settlement uh, was, was now for the prairie, was 1836. And the land was in intensive agriculture uh, until about uh, 1920. Uh, this is just a, kind of a real simple schematic of the outline of, of Curtis Prairie. Um, and what it was at the time that UW Madison acquired um, the property. So you can see that on the, on the western two thirds of the property, it was, it was in agriculture. There were two farmsteads, the, the Nelson Farm and the Bartlett Noe Farm. Um, and most of the costs were in rotation between corn, oats, uh, as well as pasture. And then the eastern uh, third of the curve is actually in a remnant piece. Um, so not plowed. So they don't have um, was climate wetter than North of the prairie, and so it was uh, more or less undisturbed. It is undisturbed. Uh, while the southern half was used as, as a mowing meadow. Um, but no soil disturbance. Um, and then from 1920 to about 1926-27, the land was, was, was fallow. Um, and then uh, after that, until 1933 or so, um, there were horses that were um, pastured on um, a lot of a lot of uh, West Memphis Prairie. And so at the time that um, the EW acquired this piece of property. Uh, the fields were dominated by quackgrass, um, and then quickly gave way to uh, bluegrass species after a couple of years. And so it's, it's really kind of a mystery of who had the first idea to create a, a prairie at the Arboretum. Uh, but what, what we do know is that Dr. Norman Chastet, uh, who was a um, the professor of botany at UW Madison and also the, the uh, curator of the Wisconsin Herbarium at the time um, began the experimental phase of, 
um, and figuring out how to introduce progresses. So this had never been done before. This is all brand new, and you know, no one, there, there was no reference about, about how to go about and do something like this. And so that professor had a student um, in John Thompson in 1935 who um, was given the responsibility to figure out the best way to plant the prairie through experimentation. And so um, he did this in a, in, a, in a few different ways. He used uh, prairie sod, basically physically cutting out um, intact sod from remnant prairies. Uh, he used seeds cut from remnant prairies and then um, plants, prairie hay, um, prairie grass. And then some small shrub will also brought over. But these, the, the first three were, were the main methods and, and materials. And they were all collected from remnant spots west of, of Madison. So if you're familiar with this part of Wisconsin, areas like Middleton, Mesa um, Spring Green, and then all along the Mystic River and Wisconsin Rivers, um, they literally take flatbed trucks onto these sites, touch sides, bring them back, and pop them down. Um, as well as later on um, focusing on, on, on feed. Um, and so, you know, once they figured out that um, the, best, the best method um, in terms of the survivability of these species was to use sod, um, Dr. Theodore Sperry was hired as the first prairie ecologist at the Arboretum. And between 1735 and 1741, he, had, he, he oversaw the first planting of the prairie. And he had a lot of help in that endeavor um, with over 200 men from the Civilian Conservation Corps um, who, were, who were housed at the Arboretum at what was called Camp Madison. So he had a pretty big, strong labor force to help him um, create this, this first prairie. Um, and, he, and like I mentioned, he started off using fog, and that's what seemed to work the best. But, um, soon he had to move to other methods because of um, the expense and just the resources needed to, to um, you know, cut sod, bring sod over, and um, place it uh, in a certain location. And, and John Curtis um, wrote about this later on. Um, basically, the expense of that technique um, outweighed its slight advantage over um, other packing methods. And so after a while, they, they used them. Uh, a variety of, of methods to test the prairie. And this is just a, a look at an example, really, of um, how how Sperry placed these, these sod blocks. And so most of the blocks were single species. He, he didn't want to lump single species together in, in different parts of the prairie. He kind of wanted to mix these single species plots uh, together. And so, um, you know, many of them, uh, as you can see, were a, a variety of sizes uh, with many different um, species in, in those sod blocks uh, that were used. And really, at this point, the idea was just to cover the prairie with prairie species, or cover the cover the ground with prairie species. Um, and so that was that was the the initial idea. And again, you know, I've done it before, so it was a lot of a lot of trial and error um, in some respect. So uh, before I go to research, I just want to mention that um, that's not doing justice to the history of uh, the South of Florida Prairie by any means. But for those of you who are interested in you know, learning more about the history of Curtis Prairie from the beginning as well as history of the Arboretum, there's a great book that was published in 2012 by Frank Torch. Um, it's, it's called Pioneers of Ecological Restoration, and it's available at uh, the Year We Can Press, and it's, it's a great account of uh, you know, who was involved from, from the beginning and kind of the history of not only Curtis Curry, but the, the uh, Arboretum in general. So I, I encourage those of you who are interested to check that book out. Um, so shifting here to, to some research highlights, there's been a lot of research done on Curtis Curry. Um, many peer-reviewed papers published. I'm just going to touch on, on a few of them, um, and really briefly. So the, the first two, um, if, you're a, if you're a land manager, you, um, you know, at this point, you take for granted. 
but you know, back in the back in the forties, um, you know, we didn't know what what fire to do uh, in terms of helping us manage the land. Um, so John Curtis and, and Max Parch published the first study of prescribed fire uh, to control invasive bluegrass, and that was done at Edgewood Prairie. Uh, and what they found was that it didn't it didn't need to control uh, those grasses and, and allowed weedy native forbs and sort of plant and curve species uh, to move into those um, what, what were uh, dominated by by bluegrass pods. And then you know, four years later, um, one of the Cleveland colleges, Virginia Klein, um, did a really nice study looking at uh, the effect of burning and mowing on uh, white tree clover. Um, at this time, in the early 80s, maybe the white tree was uh, a real problem in, in based on the prairie. And um, a lot of that was due to a, a very regular burning that had been done, that had been used on the prairie for a number of years. Um, and, you know, so given that these two clovers are, are biennial, um, she uh, was going to experiment to see if, if changing the bird regime would have an effect on reducing the cover of the clover. And so she, um, one year, they burned in early April, uh, in spring, spring and early April, and then followed the, the, the next year by a, a later spring, May burn. Uh, and found that that, that, May, that, that May burn killed um, those, those biennial plants before they could finish bolting and set seed. And you know, that's something that we take for granted now, um, but again, um, wasn't really known uh, even in, in the early 80s. Um, Mowing also was um, was a, a, a method that that works, but um, not and not quite as efficient as burning. So fast forward to some more recent studies. Um, there's a study by Kucharik and, and others that looked at um, the, the carbon stocks in the soil of the remnant of the you know, sort of map of the eastern third of the permanent remnant compared to the remnant um, stocks in the soil versus the restored prairie carbon stocks and found that you know, even after 2006, the prairie was 70 years old or so. Even that one of the prairie um, doesn't match the, the carbon stocks of a, of a remnant prairie. So, you know, we're, I'm, I'm sure it's similar now, maybe a little bit more carbon, obviously, in remnant soil, but uh, eight years later, the oldest restored prairie in the world still doesn't meet match up with what remnants have in terms of soil carbon. Um, and then a few years ago, um, uh, Mike Healy and Joy Leather did a study looking at uh, the effectiveness of a grass specific herbicide on uh, rich hairy grass. Um, rich hairy grass is one of, one of those invasive grasses that I'm sure most of us know about, and we have it at Curtis Prairie, and it's um, in the prairie, it's driven by stormwater flows. Um, luckily, it's, it's a pretty contained patch, um, but we're looking for ways that we can kind of break up break up those fat grass and be able to plant natives. And so they're looking at this pesticide herbicide uh, and found that really um, it, it would reduce the genetic grass cover, but um, after after four years of the study, the cover of green cherry grass was no different from the be control. So uh, over time, the green cherry grass uh, trips back its, its area. And then there's a follow study that's using another um, specific herbicide called called Cepidem, which you know, also shows promise, but again, uh, was not as effective as the more standard methane uh, treatment. So now I want to transition again from research to kind of talking about what we see in terms of land cover changes um, from the inception of the Arboretum and Curtis Ferry up until now. So this is a really cool uh, historical era from 1937, and it shows what basically what Madison looked like <coughs> at that time. The, the pink boundaries are the current arboretum boundaries, and the yellow boundary is uh, the current prairie as it stands now. <laughs> and so you can see that at, at this time, in, in the mid-30s, um, the, the landscape is mostly agriculture. Um, 
much more open, very little uh, urbanization happening, you know, with the exception of, um, of, of the west side here and the north areas of the Arboretum are starting to be built up. So the population is still pretty low in Madison. Um, for those of you familiar with this area, there is now an interstate that runs between uh, the Arboretum here. And that, in the 30s, that wasn't there. It's just a bunch of farm roads. So much more open. Within the Arboretum, a lot of these open areas are, are marsh, and prairie remnants, very little uh, woody cover. So if we fast forward to 80 years, everything now is in color. And we see that the has exploded in Madison uh, at least four times as, as high as it was in the, in the 30s. And, uh, and Madison has really come to the Arboretum border now. Um, the adjacent lands are very built up, lots of residential neighborhoods, businesses, um, infrastructure, roads. Um, and, and so, and as well, you can see that if we toggle back to that image, that inside the Arboretum boundary, we've gone from much more open habitat to much more exposed canopy, um, a lot more brush, a lot of this is buckthorn, uh, honeysuckle, but also just oaks that were planted. Um, and, you know, in, in very dense, um, dense uh, methods as, as, as well as time for a variety of reasons. So a lot more, a lot more woody cover. And then if we scale out a bit, this is, this is the same image that's scaled out that has the yellow line here is the watershed boundary. So you can see even within the larger watershed, it's a very urban, urbanized landscape. Um, the only, you have the only green space is really a few small parks and, and golf courses. And so we'll talk more about kind of the, the consequences of this landscape, um, primarily stormwater, and how, how it's a challenge for us uh, managing first prairie. Uh, before I turn over to Michael, um, I want to uh, talk a little bit about what the prairie is currently in terms of um, habitat types, what kind of habitats comprise the prairie. Um, so this is a close-up of Curtis Prairie, and it's, it's a very heterogeneous landscape. Um, it kind of spans the gradient from dry and easy habitats all the way to wet, including fed meadow, uh, shrub car, and a uh, small area of native cattail marks. Um, generally from, from west to east, the strongest gradient follows this line, kind of the south, southwest uh, to northeast line in terms of the dry to west range. And then to kind of fill in the gap, um, a lot of the uh, eastern and the western eastern streams are music to dry to be that. And then this little piece here, what we call the Nurture Prairie, which is actually a, a more newer restoration, is um, kind of more of a music to that. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Michael for a bit, talk about fire effects, and then we'll continue on. Okay, thanks, Brad. So, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit now about some disturbances and other influences uh, from the urban environment that we deal with uh, with our management of Curtis Prairie. And the first one, Brad already mentioned, that was the Beltline Highway. Um, and that causes fragmentation uh, right away. It uh, used to be a farm road, now it's a six lane uh, thoroughfare, it's the main artery uh, for transportation around Madison. This stretch of it gets over 100,000 uh, vehicles past it every day, and it, and it does divide our arboretum into a northern and southern section. So, overall, the, the arboretum is, is 1,200 plus acres uh, because of this. Uh, Beltline Highway, uh, a thousand acres or so lie to the north, and then we have a 200 acre parcel uh, now to the south of the Beltline Highway. So, tips uh, and fragmentation created by uh, the growth of that road over the years. Uh, you mentioned a lot of this uh, commercial and residential development uh, to the southeast. There's more up there to the northwest. And then also the golf course uh, directly adjacent to, to the Arboretum boundary and not too far from Curtis Prairie itself. And that uh, golf course actually predates the Arboretum. It was 
it was in place prior to 1934. And on, uh, on one hand, you know, it's, it's green space, it's a decent buffer, definitely better than if it was uh, commercial or residential development. But on the other hand, you know, their, their land use goals are different than ours, and, and they do have an impact uh, occasionally. There's another road that goes right through the middle of that northern part of the Arboretum. Uh, it's a two-mile road, just a two-lane, just a two-lane road, um, but still causes more uh, fragmentation of that of that northern part. And then within the prairie itself, oh, then we also have uh, the footprint of our visitor center uh, and our maintenance buildings uh, directly to the prairie to the north. And then in the prairie itself, there's a series of maintenance roads, and some of those roads date back to date back to the 1930s, um, and you know were in use at the time that was in agricultural production. And then some of the roads have been put in uh, since the 1930s over the years for uh, various reasons. But those uh, the way those roads are set up through the prairie now, you can see kind of divide the prairie into, into the four subunits that that we uh, make our management off of today. And here's another look at those four uh, different subunits. I wanted to show you those because um, just to give you a little context for the prairie as a whole um, as we as we continue our talk and talk about fire and plant data, you know, there's these four kind of unique uh, subunits that have different histories and Brian talked about the the moisture and how it it moves from dry to wet uh, as you move from west to south. But then, uh, you know, the eastern part over here is remnant. Uh, the northern part of that unit, uh, pretty much completely undisturbed uh, over the years in terms of, of soil disturbance. Um, not through the stormwater, which we'll get to soon enough. But he did mention, you know, this was used for for hay production occasionally in dry years. It's a little higher and drier than the north end. Uh, but it was used for hay, probably had grazing on it uh, at some point as well. The central part was where the uh, restoration efforts actually began in 1935. You can see it's uh, the biggest subunit of the four. And then West Curtis restoration efforts began in 1936 on that nine acre unit. And then what we call the nursery prairie is four acres. Um, nursery in that it was a nursery for the horticultural collections, which were on the north side of the visitor center. Um, in the mid 1980s, the nursery was moved to this area over here, and then this was planted uh, back to prairie. In, in 1986, so much younger, much younger uh, restoration here than the other parts. The main parts are pretty steady. I'm going to talk a little bit now about another disturbance that's been present uh, on the landscape here, and that's fire. Uh, fire research began at the Arboretum in 1941. Um, Maybe even in the late 30s, um, we don't have good documentation of that, but it's possible it, it did start in the late 30s. But definitely in 1941, uh, scrap fires were being done for research purposes at the Arboretum and our first prairie. And that, that continued through the 40s, and then in 1950, they had their first uh, quote, landscape scale fire, what we think of now as a prescribed fire uh, on Curtis Prairie. The first one of those uh, occurred in 1950, and those have been occurring at a fairly regular basis uh, since then. Now, uh, I want to get too far ahead of myself, but at the end of this talk, we're going to conclude with a bunch of words about here. Uh, uh, regarding fire, a couple of lessons we've learned over the years uh, are not to wear tank tops, and conducting prescribed burns, and not to use children on the fire either. So what you're looking at here is uh, the best uh, record of fire history on Curry Curry that we've been able to compile so far. This is from 1950 uh, through 2014. I don't have 15 and 16. Uh, 
included here, but uh, from 1950, time of the first burn, up into 2014. And if you see the number one in a cell, that just means there was a fire in that particular subunit that year. If the cell is blank, it's a fire. The rows highlighted in orange uh, indicate that we don't have good, reliable records or data uh, for those years, or maybe we do have data, but we're not, we don't have a lot of confidence in their reliability. And so those years uh, highlighted in orange have been excluded from the, from the data and from the figures that I'm going to show, show you next. So you can think of the 50s as being a nine-year decade, the 1954 taken out. The 60s were a seven-year decade, and the 70s, uh, not a great decade, only three years of, of reliable data there. So that's a, that's a three-year decade there. So for West Curtis, um, this is 1950, uh, all the way up to last year. Um, the fire frequency on average uh, per decade has been 53%. So just over a fire uh, half of the time or every other year. And since 1980, We've had 20 fires. We have really good records from 1980 to present, and so we can we can calculate uh, a reliable mean return interval because we don't have any years that we're missing information from. So the the mean return intervals are only uh, calculated from 1980 to the present. And for for West Curtis, that interval is uh, just just shy of two growing seasons in between fires. So it's uh, if we're having fire every year on an annual basis, um, that return interval would be one. And if we're having it every other year, it would be two. And so we're uh, on, uh, since 1980, has done just a little bit better. It's had a fire every other year for West Curtis. For Central Curtis, uh, a little bit less than that, 46% overall since 1950. 17 total fires since 1980 with a return interval of over two growing seasons. For East, also right about 50%, 18 fires since 1980, and a return interval of 1.9 growing seasons. And then for the nursery prairie, remember that was first planted uh, in 86, so its first season available for fire would have been 1987, so the 80s here is just uh, a three year decade. So overall, since then, it's had uh, converged 42% of the time on average of 14 fires in the return interval of two growing seasons. And then this is just another way uh, of looking at those numbers. This is the overall burn frequency since 1915. This is not an average by decade, but just overall for those years for which we had this data, and you can see, uh, you know, we're right around 50% give or take for all four units, so roughly a fire every other year. And so uh, you can keep that uh, in the back of your mind um, as a fire history for these different units as Brad uh, talking about plant data shortly. And then the other major disturbance uh, as our reading as a whole, but also Curry's Prairie has been stormwater input. So that has definitely increased over the years as the urban uh, development has increased uh, around our region. As Brad mentioned, we're in the bottom of the watershed, somewhat unfortunately, and so we're, we're greatly affected by these stormwater inputs, especially as we get more and more bigger uh, uh, snow, uh, rain and snow events that contribute uh, more stormwater inputs. So what these figures are showing, the number uh, in the triangle just refers to the average annual runoff in acre feet. So uh, right here, there's enough water coming in on an annual basis to cover 136 acres with a foot of water. And so if you add all these numbers up, uh, it's more than 1,200, so we're getting more than a foot of water for every acre of the arboretum uh, coming in. And just in stormwater from the outside, that's not telling what, what falls naturally uh, in, within the arboretum boundaries. So another major disturbance that is affecting uh, everything that we do here. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Brad, who's going to uh, talk about some vegetation data. All right, I'm going to try and run through um, 
some some historical events there that we've reflected over the past uh, 70 plus years. Um, the past well several times. I'm going to try and go through this pretty quickly to make sure I have time for question at the end. Um, so I'm not going too in depth with the data. I'm going to stick with kind of general trends. This is a graph of the total species um, by year that, it was, that they requested. Again, each year has a, has a, has a bar. The so blue bars are species without, without species included. The red, uh, including exotics, obviously those will, be, those will be higher. And so generally, you can see uh, an, an increase in just the total number of species um, over the years. And our last um, comprehensive data set that we have is from 2002. Just which was um, requested by uh, Chet Snyder, who's a master student, uh, and published his thesis in 2004. So that's the last uh, kind of holistic look at, at the current vegetation. Uh, so we're definitely due for another um, comprehensive survey. We have had smaller surveys done since then, uh, nothing that would be uh, comparable with the uh, long term data set. Uh, and each one of these years, you know, different folks are involved in touching. The, the data as well. But general trends are on the increase in terms of species. And then on the far right part of the graph, I put a, a remnant curry uh, called stable curry, which is um, kind of a, a, a wet music to wet curry about 40 minutes east of Madison. Um, it's about the same size for this curry. Um, and, you know, it's maybe a bit wetter, but it does have dry components. And so I just, I just wanted to put this up here just to show that. Although the term curry, um, for a restored curry is pretty diverse in terms of the number of species, it doesn't quite compare yet to uh, this particular remnant curry. Um, so just, just to show that uh, it's, it's difficult, like I talked about with the, with the carbon studies, it's difficult after 80 years to match uh, certain metrics with, with remnant um, curry. Um, so this, this is a graph showing uh, two different things. We've got the mean uh, coefficient of conservatism on the right-hand side, and then the forest quality index on the left-hand side. And if you're not familiar with what the C values are on the right-hand side, so um, the plants are um, are assigned these, these values um, by by experts in the field. So they're a subjective, a subjective measure, uh, but they give you they give us a sense. Uh, you know, which species are more common and can be found, kind of more general species, or species that are you know, limited to zero to three, for example. You can find them a lot, they're not, they're not rare. And then the higher end species, eight, nine, and ten, are the more uncommon, um, more, more rare species. Uh, so you can see that the average mean, uh, the average C has been pretty steady over the years, you know, four to four and a half to five. Um, which is, which, which is pretty good uh, for, uh, for, uh, for restoration. Um, and in, in terms of the uh, source of quality, it kind of follows the, the, the same trend as the total species data. Uh, general increase, uh, so in 2002, our last data set that we have, comprehensive data set, uh, and we're looking at around 65. Um, to 70 SQI, which is a really high number for a, a current restoration. Um, again, doesn't quite match the remnant of the curry, um, but you know, it, it's showing that at least by these basic metrics, current curry is, is, is a very diverse curry. So to dig a little bit deeper into the Snyder data, these are graphs um, taken from his, his data, um, just looking at general trends. Um, picking a couple of species. Uh, the pig blue stem, the white bacteria, the human after, black eyed Susan have all shown general increases over time, uh, which is great. These are, you know, prairie species that might see increasing. So one more up there, prairie dog, general increase. But they all share um, a commonality that between the 91 survey and the 2002 survey, they all taken a dip down. Uh, and we'll talk about so maybe why that might be, um, but still over time they did they, they increase. And there's already some, some decreases too. So these are some species that um, from the start have been on the decline. 
Um, so three out of ten is a wild uh, Timothy, uh, non MVP fuse. Um, this this kind of chain here in the lower left, carry after the upper right, and then the lower right uh, rolling up for me. I've all shown a pretty consistent decline. And again, you know, um, might be from competition with other current species, um, probably uh, you know, as um, current grasses have increased. Um, they may have they may have not been able to compete with those grasses. Um, in addition, these particular species are are upland species. And as Michael was talking about, we have seen an increase in stormwater. Parts of the prairie are much wetter than they were historically. Um, that that could be at least in the last three decades. It could be a reason why some of these are are very low now. So of course um, we have our share of native species, and you can just a few. Um, the top two here, Cornus racemosa, uh, gray dogwood, and Salvia chandensis, uh, chandelier goldenrod are native species, uh, but they obviously can be invasive, and it's so different on uh, Cornus prairie. Uh, and then uh, some of your worst non-native invasive at the in general, and actually throughout Wisconsin wetlands is the three canary grass, Polaris, from the ACA. Um, now, at the Arboretum, it's, a, um, it's, it's not ubiquitous. I'm sorry, I'm sure it's current. It's not ubiquitous. It's, it's found in the path of stormwater. So it's a stormwater-driven species, and it's, um, it's actually not um, expanding very much, and I'll show a map of that in a, in a few slides. But um, you know, stormwater has been coming out of the current for the last 30 years, and that kind of coincides with what you see in this graph the increase in, in, in that species. I, I want to go back to, to Grim Dogwood quickly because we'll talk more about this later and Michael will talk about it in a second term. But, um, you know, the, our, our native woody species are one of our biggest problems apart from stormwater. And Grim Dogwood is probably one of the, one of the biggest challenges that, that we face. And so, um, you know, some of the trends that we're seeing um, in, the, in the decreasing species, and even the ones that are increasing and have shown a decrease uh, in the last, you know, decades or so, could be because of this increase in, in gray dogwood, um, as well as the other species. But it's a point that is really ubiquitous on the current prairie right now, and it's working hard to manage. Um, so this is looking at, uh, again, Ted Snyder 2002 data. Um, this is a, an image of the number of native species per quadrat. So he sampled over a thousand one by one meter square quadrat on the prairie. Um, so this, this includes the native species in each quadrat. And so the, the cooler colors, the blues and the greens, are, are quadrats that have high native diversity, upwards of you know, high 20s or low 30s per, per plot, number of species. And the, the warmer colors, the oranges um, and, 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 and red, are thought to have very few, if any, native species. And so, you know, if you look at this image for a while, you can kind of pick out some, some patterns. Uh, if you recall, this eastern third of the prairie is a remnant. And so a lot of the high diversity that we have in the prairie are still found in, 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 that, in that piece. So there are, in Central Curtis, there are a lot of uh, high, um, high richness plots as well. But a lot of the richness comes in this, in this remnant section. And as well, there's this swath of, of, of a low native diversity in these plots. Um, and this, this is corresponding to stormwater. It's right in the path of stormwater flows. As Michael mentioned, this is Zooming in on that image he showed before of um, the amount of stormwater coming in each one of these um, ponds that we have. And again, Curtis Pond is actually an artificial pond. It's an engineer detection pond to treat stormwater. But just these two inlets alone uh, bring in about 22 million gallons of stormwater a year, which is an incredible amount of water. It doesn't include just um, natural precipitation. And, and following the elevation of the land, um, the past stormwater um, flows right over this, this sort of warm, these, these warm colored quadrats. And so we can surmise that um, that stormwater has had an impact on, on plant diversity. Um, so 
my question is, well, how? How is that impact occurring? And uh, you know, there's, there's lots of ways that it's that, that happening. But two two main ways is that you know, with stormwater, we're we're talking about um, very turbid, low quality water, um, but high in nutrients like phosphorus and and, and nitrogen. And most native plants can't deal with that um, kind of um, high high nutrient water. Um, but there are invasive plants like root carrier grass that thrive in that kind of system. Um, and then there's a, that, 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 that's one impact. Um, and and root carrier grass in Curtis Curry has really found a, a monotype where it's present. And so that's, that's um, decreased native plants in those areas. But also it's just changed the, the moisture of, of the soils. And so this area, this uh, stormwater path, is much, much wetter than it was, was historically. And so, you know, those prior upland plants simply have been lost in those areas. Um, and some of those, some of the, even the native wetland plants can, can outcompete other plants. And so here's kind of what I was talking about. Here's this uh, genetic data map put together by Joy Zettler and Mark Wigginer, as well as uh, several citizen scientists over the past few years. And it's, it's uh, and I'll kind of, if I toggle back quickly, it's a similar footprint. You can see um, the, the red and orange uh, plot there. And this, this, is, this is looking at basically, they just delineated um, areas where there were um, wetland plants, specifically. And so you can see how in the of stormwater, the orange here is, is regenerating grass, and this is a monotype, more or less. There's one or two uh, natives in there. Um, with very low, low density, low, low frequency. But beyond that, uh, a, a lot of this are, are native wetland plants. Uh, blue joint grass, for example, in, in, in the purple, uh, mix of carrot species, uh, primarily tuffic sedge, carrot crypto. Uh, this is the green here, or native cattail, type of um, monopolio. Um, the pink is artino, or native prairie core grass. Uh, the willows here, uh, Samurai willows, are, are, are native, but can be invasive, and in this prairie they are invasive, and we can work in those as well. And then just mix plant vegetation um, would make up the bulk of it. But that's almost 15 acres, um, so it's you know, more than a quarter of the entire area up on the prairie. Uh, is, 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 is much wetter than it was historically. Um, and, and again, it's not all about vegetation, but it's vegetation um, in the native that, that can compete with some of our, our other natives. Um, so just to wrap up here, um, some of the best vegetation trends I know is uh, not doing it justice, but um, this is an image from, again, the test time data. The green circles are his plot, where he found um, corn for the most of the great dogwood. You can see it's pretty much ubiquitous in the prairie, except for the wet area that we just talked about in here. And then um, Jim Dory and Joy Dendor did a column study on a subset of his plot um, and found that over half of his plot also had great dogwood. And actually, there were some that he found here and here that Chet Sider did not find. So, um, Florida is filling the gaps, making more complete cover. So before I turn over to Michael here, just kind of some take-up messages about this data. The prairie is very diverse for a, a restoration. Um, it's in good shape in terms of the, of the number of species um, and the abundance of, of those native prairie species that we want. You know, over time, some are increasing, some are decreasing. Um, but in terms of a follow-up study, what we're interested in is those, those native prairie species that were increasing and that have shown a decrease since last survey. We want to know the sort of why that is. Um, we can surmise that it's on wood and storm water, and we need to follow up with a more recent um, comprehensive survey. So with that, that's really quick. I'm going to turn it back over to Michael to kind of bring us all those buttons on. And, and Brad, so we just talked a lot about the history, uh, briefly talked a lot about the history of Curry Curry and kind of what the current situation is, so now we'd like to end by spending a little time discussing uh, how to interpret all of that and how it shapes the way we think about Curry's Curry's future. Um, so the first lesson I think that's important to point out that gets lost sometimes uh, by us here on staff, but uh, 
by owners also is that Curtis Perry was and still is a restoration experiment. Uh, might be obvious, but assuming that a piece of rich prairie was a goal was important, you know, to remind people that the planting of that used by Curtis in the 30s were likely not the ones they used to say that the goal was, uh, you know, a piece of rich prairie from a abandoned ag field. Uh, methods have advanced a long way since then, uh, thanks to groups like this one and just people, uh, other people experimenting and, and talking about what they find. And, and because of that, you know, we might do it differently today. But back then, they didn't, they didn't have that luxury of knowing, knowing how to do it enough. They had to take the experimental approach. And in a lot of ways, that experiment still continues today as to our, our adaptive management efforts to, uh, to make improvements where needed. We're still adding, still adding species to some of the gaps. Uh, left over from that original uh, plot planting method. Uh, we're trying to enhance diversity in the, in the areas of lower quality, always uh, thinking of new methods to try, and ideally testing those experimentally for their effectiveness. And we really feel like the restoration is a, is a long way from being finished, uh, if it even ever will be, uh, after eight years. And as we discussed, uh, throughout, in the grand scheme of things, uh, Curtis Prairie and our breed in general, for that matter, uh, are both quite small. Uh, they're, they're far from pristine, and, and they're not exactly in what we would consider to be an ideal location, but, but the conservation value of the prairie is still, is still tremendous. There's great plant diversity, lots of uncommon species. Um, you know, we've got Tested, uh, the affiliated woodpeckers on the unit adjacent to the prairie. We've got a robust, uh, brushy patch bumblebee population as far as, as far as their populations go. Um, we had our first landing sterile sighting on the prairie, uh, last spring. It's a great stopover site for grass plant birds and waterfowl that are migrating. Uh, coyote, we have snakes, uh, weasels, all kinds of mammals. So for being in the middle of the city, it, it really does have tremendous conservation value. Uh, but that being said, you know, because of its size, we think that, you know, one of the best things for the prairie going forward is going to be more prairie or, or similar habitat that is found on prairies like Oak Savannah. So, so we're also looking at expanding uh, where feasible, and, and we've done that uh, recently. Uh, just a real uh, quick example. Here's the, the outline of Curtis Prairie. Uh, the fourth subunit as a whole is about 70 acres, and then in 2009, uh, a stormwater management research facility was built right here. But the, the perimeter of that was planted with native. Uh, prairie vegetation. So we, we looked at that as a five acre, five acre extension of, of East Curtis Prairie. And then, uh, on buttons over the years, uh, especially in 2013 though, uh, when we brought a horse removal in to mow a lot of the base of uh, this unit we opened up 15 new acres of, of wet prairie and oak savanna and sedge meadow. And then that connected to an existing prairie restoration and remnant uh, to the north that gave us an additional five acres. And so when you add all that in, uh, the Curtis Prairie complex increased to, to 95 acres. And so we're looking to, to do that kind of work where possible because we can't expand our boundaries, but you know we might be able to expand uh, some of our uh, more valuable units within our boundaries. And kind of related to that, um, over the last five years or so, we, we started coming to terms with the fact that the northern Wisconsin plant communities have not been very successful, and in some cases, they've been counterproductive to some of our more successful restorations and, and high-quality remnants. Um, the, the northern tree species have filled in fairly well, but the, the understory species that have been planted have not, and you know, for obvious reasons, uh, you can probably figure out why. Uh, but in, in lots of cases, too, these northern Wisconsin plant communities uh, harbor a lot of invasive species that, that give us trouble elsewhere uh, on our site. So, so we're in the early stages of, of making plans and in some cases even implementing those plans. 
uh, for the removal of those northern Catholic communities and replacing them with southern Catholic communities that are more appropriate for the site. And this is a major change from the ARC's original vision uh, and how the ARC has been managed for uh, the last 80 years, but we're, we're kind of excited about the new opportunities that, that it might present. And just a quick example, going back to this 95-acre uh, Curtis Prairie complex, you know, we could envision uh, doing work incrementally where uh, we start restoring uh, these, these northern uh, Wisconsin uh, pines and spruce and fir that had been planted uh, along this stretch uh, back in the early days of our freedom and, you know, just slowly uh, restoring those back to the prairie in Oak Savannah, um, like we've been here historically, and then, you know, that essentially doubles that original, you know, outline of the four prairie subunits that I showed you, which was 70 acres, now we're up to 140. Uh, for us, at the Arboretum, uh, dormant season for scrap fire has not uh, been affected by its own in controlling those invasive native shrubs like the great dogwood that Brad mentioned. Um, in some cases, we think that, that the fire even accelerated their spread and, and helped it uh, move throughout the prairie. Um, you know, I don't, we, we could argue what a frequent fire regime might be, but I think, you know, roughly every other year on average is, is fairly frequent fire, not uh, annual fire, but still uh, really frequent, I think, um, especially considering over that, that duration of time since 1950. But um, uh, even though, even though there hasn't been that much fire, it hasn't been enough on its own to uh, to keep the, the trust in check. If you remember that slide that I showed you of the dogwood abundance, you know, in 1951 it was virtually non-existent on the prairie, but by the 2000s it was in over half of the sample cost and has been increasing uh, since then. So, you know, going forward, we still intend to use fire to the greatest extent that we can, uh, given the urban, the urban landscape that we're in, just because it has, you know, we know the benefits uh, it has to, to the native herbaceous plants, especially, but our shrub management is going to require more large-scale mowing and, and herbicide application, which we've already been implementing in the last uh, few years. And then for us, uh, you know, being uh, having such a high public profile, part of the challenge for us with that is trying to change the, the conventional narrative about fire, that it's the silver bullet that keeps trees and shrubs out of prairies, and, and we don't think that's always true, at least not in our particular situation. I think there's probably a lot of other variables uh, interacting um, to, to, to get the results that we see in terms of shrub, shrub expansion. So we're going to try and uh, learn more about that and communicate that, uh, those findings to our stakeholders and, and help them uh, hopefully learn that, you know, fire isn't necessarily a silver bullet this day and age, especially in, in our particular site. Uh, we've learned that it's important to let the plants work themselves out over time, and this is something that's been happening on Pretty Prairie for, for the entire 80 years. Um, and to a certain extent, you know, it doesn't, we don't think it pays to try forcing the land to be something that it doesn't want to be. We want to encourage the species that are appropriate for the site, given the current conditions of the site, with, you know, with an eye in the future, of course. And sometimes there's this preconceived notion that Curtis Prairie has to be prairie and only prairie, and that's the end of the discussion. But as Brad showed you earlier, you know, parts, parts of, uh, of Curtis are trending more towards wetland vegetation, and we've got other parts that are, you know, maybe in the early stages of trending back towards Oak Savannah, which, which it was historically. And, and we're okay with that, and, you know, we're going to encourage it to uh, continue along those trajectories, uh, you know, to, to a certain extent, as long as the prairie grass isn't. Uh, overtaking the wetland parts or the, the invasive shrubs aren't overtaking the uplands. And then also I want to point out that we're thinking this beyond just species, especially plant species, competition and are interested in plant, uh, you know, vegetation structure and how that relates to wildlife habitat, managing for ecological processes and resiliency 
in light of climate change and any other services that we're faced with here. So to plug in for good science and, and good monitoring, we think those are necessary to know what you have on your site and how your management is affecting your site. And if your goals are being met, uh, my manager should always be looking for ways to incorporate science and monitoring uh, to meet the needs uh, of their site and their specific projects. And then that information can be shared with others, like Paul was alluding to uh, at the beginning discussing with GRI. And, you know, even though we've been affiliated with a major research university for eight years and had, had a lot of great research conducted here, uh, we feel like we can never have enough data. We want that, we want that best available science that Paul was talking about also uh, to, to guide our management. And so building upon our existing uh, robust re research program here is going to be a major priority for us going forward. And then I'll just conclude uh, by saying that you shouldn't assume that your site will always be far removed from uh, the effect of urbanization, especially with urban areas expanding more rapidly now as, as more people move there uh, from the rural areas. And uh, looking back to the 30s, you know, our region was surrounded primarily by agriculture and didn't take long for seeing gold by the city. And, you know, maybe where you're at with your site, urbanization really isn't a threat. Uh, but it's so hard to assess what threats uh, there are uh, outside of your boundaries and what can be done to mitigate them, ideally, uh, proactively. And so some of the things we've been doing at the Arboretum that everyone can do, no matter where they're at, no matter what they're saying, is whether it's urban or rural, include building good relationships with neighbors, um, partnering to the extent possible in watershed planning, get to know your local officials so you can influence policy, if need be, and then uh, maybe most importantly, investing public outreach. Think of well, educated public can be our biggest asset. We're going to need their support if we're going to if we're going to meet our goals here or anywhere. I think that's true for for everybody, no matter no matter where your site is. So I'll say on behalf of Brad and myself, thank you again for the invitation and the opportunity uh, to do this, and we'll we'll take any questions. Okay, well, thanks, Scott. Thank you all. We sure appreciate the time, but uh, we're a few minutes over already, so. Yeah, I'm fine with that. No, it's not a problem. It's all good stuff. We wouldn't want you to cut it short. So, um, we have recorded this. So, um, let me see if I can pull up the, uh, um, see if we got some questions waiting for us. No, it doesn't look like we had too much, so um, I guess we're okay then. So, Jim, again, I thank you for your time. I appreciate everybody calling in. And, uh, Can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, this is Pauline Drapney. And I noticed that, um, you know, it, uh, your, your burn interval, you're talking about a uh, uh, 50% burn interval, roughly, um, and, and extrapolating that to me every other year. Is it really truly every other year, or is that an average? That every other year, it's a very different sort of extent than if you have it um, three years off and then three years in a row or something like that. Yeah, that's the average for all those years since 1980. So some years it might be uh, two, some years it might be one, some years it might be four, but that's the, that's the average. So when you think about that increase in woody species, um, it, it, it's probably important to be thoughtful about what those intervals actually are as opposed to thinking about that as an average of every other year. I mean, this is a fantastic discussion. I've really enjoyed hearing all of this, uh, but I think it's really important to think about, about something like that. And I also heard you say that uh, dormant fires aren't the answer to Douglas. Are they all dormant fires? Yeah, for the most part, uh, maybe some late, late spring where something had, you know, begun leaking out and turning green, but no, nothing that I would consider to be a growing season fire. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so, so that's interesting too. Okay, and then the other thing I'd like to ask has to do with, I noticed that um, your, your uh, 
So you have about a 50% return, and although we don't know exactly what that means in terms of um, how many years between, yeah. exactly how that's applied, but I noticed in the current decade, and I know you don't have data for this, this decade yet, I hope that you get it, but um, we're down to 14% for this, for this decade. So we're into the seventh year of this decade. What do you predict will happen as a result of that dramatic decrease in fire on the landscape? Yeah, I think um, that's a good observation, and that the decrease has occurred for uh, a variety of reasons. But I'm optimistic, you know, like I said, we've ramped up our mowing, especially our large scale mowing, um, and herbicide follow up. And there was enough uh, native vegetation still underneath those dogwood and smooth sumac is, a, is one we struggle with too. But in the majority of those areas, uh, there was enough native vegetation, although suppressed, it was still hanging on underneath and, and bounced back really well. So I think once we do get our next fire in there uh, to supplement the mowing and herbicide work that we've done, uh, we're going to have, uh, you know, we're going to have a, a really good result. Well, I'd be really interested in hearing, seeing, uh, hearing what the results of your next, of this decade monitoring. I hope you're able to get that done. And then one final question. Um, I've got a million questions, but one more that came to mind is that do you think about or are you concerned about the um, um, increased CO2 levels in the atmosphere with time, uh, changing climate relative to um, increases uh, uh, the, the effect that that favors woody species? Yeah, absolutely. When, when I mentioned, I, I thought it was a, a multi-variant cause that, that may uh, have, have led to the, uh, the shrub increase that we've seen. That was definitely one of the factors I think that, that could be playing a role. That's just speculation and based on what I've read uh, and from, from other places, but it, it would certainly make sense that that could be, could be happening here and happening, coming in the back. Sure. Thanks so much for your presentation today. Hey, yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question. Hey, if you guys got a minute, there's another one on the chat uh, from Mike Long. He asked if we if you've tried interseeding using strip disking and seeding, or if you've done any spike seeding in problem areas to increase diversity and reduce invasive species. Uh, we have not, as far as I know, was uh, in the 10 years that, that Brad and I have worked here, uh, nothing that extensive has been done. Um, it's mostly been smaller scale stuff, ever seeing my hand, uh, transplanting plugs, that sort of thing. Yeah, have you also like any and kind of follow those by any chance? Don't need any uh, follow on data for those? If you know, one's done better than the other, have you, have you looked at it that closely? Do you know that you have anything that's quantitative? Um, no, not, not really. Again, I just thought I'd get out there, um, but I think it's going to be analyzed, quite frankly, but um, probably no, we haven't asked those specific questions. Okay. Uh, there are a couple of the comments, um, one of which is, I don't know, can you guys see the, uh... Yeah, I, I'm trying to find, I'm at the chat part of the... Yes. There's a scroll uh, thing there on the right. And there's a long one from uh, Lisa Galvin in, in there. She was particularly interested that we share. So it was very impressive. She appreciates the uh, focus on ecosystems more so than uh, um, systems that include native plant communities and include the plant communities, especially as we consider restoring native processes. We need to reconsider our landscapes uh, that are decidedly not natural. Which is certainly a good point that you all have made for us today. Yeah. Um, and uh, let's see, help to ensure that our rarest, most sensitive species, including inverts, um, and how we apply those tools need to be very definitely need to be nuanced, which is a great point. Yeah, that's that a good point. Actually, and Mike, we can talk about this too. But you know, we're we're not the conscious that you know whatever management we do, and this is running practitioner have benefits to some species, um, but probably is negative to, to other species. And so burning, you know, we don't burn the whole curry at once. We burn units uh, at a time to leave a 
confusion on for those you know, things like species, for example. Um, I think the most important thing we can do is, that, like Michael talked about again, is whenever we can increase uh, the high quality habitat, work out some curtis prairie and basically make, make more current, make more continuous habitat. And we have another question. It was, uh, want to know how much effort other staff volunteer, uh, staff or volunteer hours are dedicated to weed and irrigation control every year. Do you have a, an idea? Well, there's, uh, there's myself who, who doesn't contribute a whole lot. I mean, I'm uh, <laughs> the chain of events, I guess. But then I have a crew of four that, uh, are year round, uh, full time in terms of field pretty much 100% of the time. Uh, we have a student crew that usually is uh, three or four students, uh, pretty close to full time in the summertime, you know, during the main part of the growing season. And then hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of hours of, of volunteer help. And one thing we, we didn't mention was, uh, you know, we have the, the 1,240 acres here, but we also have 11 outlying properties that the university owns and the Arboretum oversees management of. So we're, we're doing active management at probably the conference is now in talk mode. Right. Probably doing management at eight of those 11, and that's another 500 properties. So it's a big, a big effort. Yeah, it sounds like it. That's all the questions that are on the chat. Um, I opened the phone up if anybody else wants to try to ask a question. If you guys have time to stick around a little bit longer. Yeah, sure. I'm still here. Um, if you want to pass out the school, if they have to leave already, they can always uh, track us down. You know, our contact info is on our RBA website. So if they want to get in touch with us uh, at a later time, you can come to feel free. Okay. And I appreciate you mentioning that. When we send out the uh, link for the recording, Governor, I will include that. Okay. The only thing is, you got to do Hey, folks, uh, we unmuted the phone, so if you're talking in the background, it's not a question. We ask if you can kind of keep it down a little bit. <laughs> yes. thank, thank you very much, Brad and Michael. That was really interesting. I, I think we've reached a logical end point. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in today.